Hello there and welcome back to a lecture series. I'm Ted, your host, and we're going to continue right along with our examination of African history. And for this lecture, we are going to look at the we're going to look at the rise of development of states and the organization of states and the culture that arose in Central Africa. And particularly, we're going to look at the uh, the area around the Lake Chad Basin. Now, before we begin our lecture proper, I would like to go back and just recap on what we discussed in our last lecture. So, in our last lecture, we looked at the um, the development of states and civilizations in the inland Niger Delta region. Uh, we looked at the, the shift of population from the uh, from what is now the uh, the southern deserts in Mauritania. Um, had the desert encroached, the the people fled um, southwards. Um, they and they they uh, they sort of land they sort of migrated um, had they fled had they fled the death they migrated into the uh, the inland Niger Delta region um, they, uh, they 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 found that environment more hospitable um, previously during the wetter phase of uh, the of uh, of Africa the region had just been too swampy too overgrown with vegetation too wet to really sustain um dense human population but once the uh, the region had dried up a bit once um once it had become less swampy less overgrown with vegetation um it, it became more hospitable for sustained human uh settlement and uh once the once african rice had been um domesticated uh, it led to an enormous growth uh, and it's really an explosion in human population um, that explosion led to the development of more uh, larger and more sustainable states uh, and cities uh, such as Jiao and Jenny Jano we looked at Jenny Jano and Jenny Jano one of the more remarkable sites of West Africa we examined uh, the role of Jenny Jano has an important urban center um, and an important trade center uh, we looked at the uh, the farming capabilities the agricultural capabilities of Jenny Jano we looked at the um, the internal trade um, that that was um, put into place at uh, by the demands of sustaining Jenny Jano uh, iron stone bronze all had to be imported so it facilitated the uh, the cultural exchange and the economic exchange in those regards and also served as a, um, a storage and then a uh, projection center for the gathering of ivory and gold and salt and slaves and all the other goods uh, and commodities that they uh, that the West African states would uh, or urban centers would gather and then project northward to engage in this uh, trans-Saharan trade with port cities along the coast of North Africa and um and uh with that being said i'd like to transition now into uh into our lecture topic for today the uh development of states and culture around the uh in central africa around the the lake chad basin area now in many parts of africa the path to statehood and the organization of complex interactions um, are, are not well understood and, and this is really due to a lack of research and scholarship um, the Lake Chad Basin area in Central Africa is one of these areas. Um, the Lake Chad Basin area was affected by environmental changes. Um, these changes uh, um, affected, uh, these, these are the same changes that affected North Africa um, had the desert began to creep in. During the wet period, Lake Chad expanded um, and a network of rivers and lakes that were well watered rose. Um, these well-watered lakes and rivers uh, fed grasslands and savannas that spread out throughout the region. Uh, Lake Chad egg expanded, becoming um, really more of an inland sea. It, uh, it, it is known by archaeologists and people who uh, study this area that this period has Lake Mega Chad. And Lake Mega Chad connected the, uh, the networks of the rivers and the lakes um, that existed this time and this would include the Nile River uh, to its east and the Niger River to its west. Um, 
in the early period uh the sahara region um in this early period the sahara region was a system of pathways used by people moving between the coastal regions of north africa and the savannah and the grasslands of west and central africa um along with the the marshy riverlands of east africa and this was a, a very productive region it yielded great bounties um you you could re you could uh, count on the uh the belt the wealth of the uh, mediterranean african coast to the uh to the equi uh equatorial bounty in the regions of uh, africa that way now between 8000 and 2500 bce uh beginning with cattle pasturing um uh beginning with cattle pasturing the region began to undergo um a, a very uh, uh a very distinct uh, and permanent sort of transition. Um, cattle pasturing was followed very, uh, very closely with millet and sorghum cultivation, and these would sort of alter the uh, the settlement and the um, uh, the social development of the region. Now, the region to the south and to the east were wet and they allow for a similar agriculture and pastoralism to arrive. Now these areas were home to hunting and gathering populations um, who primarily subsisted uh, by foraging through this region and living at low density population sites. Now this period has a fair deal of controversy attached to it. Uh, it's been a while since I've actually had to broach a controversial subject in our lecture in, in our lecture series. Now um the, the 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 controversy attached to this uh to this um to this period is mainly due to questions surrounding the beginning of the cultivation and use of tubular crops like yams um in tropical forest in the uh, tropical forest regions of africa yams have a long history in the region but because of the nature of the crops and the environment they they do not preserve well uh especially at our, ac our agricultural um archaeological sites they the uh the crops do not preserve well um unlike let's say the millet we we still have um, millet samples in uh the in the uh the desert regions of southern mauritania we still have millet samples in uh the indus river valley sites so so we can sort of gauge how long they've been there how long people have been using them due to those exact samples but we do not have the same for yams and this makes examining the archaeology um, of non-cereal crops very difficult has the area dried up um and the desert returned it pushed the people further to the south and to the east. Um, North Africa became um, too dry to support the cattle pastoralism um, or the agricultural, or the agriculture. And had this occurred, the Lake Chad region and the Nile River um, became Nile River Valley became more hospitable. The farmers and the pastoralists they took advantage of this, um, and, and villages from uh, from from half we can see. Uh, hailing from what we know had the Ghani, uh, the Gaji Ghana culture begin to appear in what is now northern Nigeria around 1800 BCE. Now, the culture of the Gaji Ghana produced stone tools, ceramics, bone tools, uh, and these are all distinct to southern, uh, to the southern North African deserts. Um, the Ghani Gaja appear to be uh, pastoralists uh, who have um, who harvest wild grains with uh, with millet gaining more and more importance. Now the exclusive use of wild grains by sedentary village populations is unusual. Um, they, they do not farm. Uh, they harvest the wild grains uh, partly because um, of the great expanse and of course the abundance of the wild crops which made farming unnecessary. People do not adopt what they do not need. Um, the people do not have to cultivate the crops for their survival and the great abundance of the wild grain still exists in this area and is still used by the local population during periods of stress. Um, during crop failures or droughts, they return to this old habit. Um, now, this is how uh, the domestication of other crops um, really begin. Um, people simply uh, develop a taste for it. They habitually do it. And then they say, well, uh, 
instead of going way out here to this one side to gather i'll simply plant it closer to me and i'll simply protect it and and uh harvest it when i'm when when it's uh when it's ready to uh to be harvested now by the middle of the first century bce some of the Gani Gaja uh, cultures were living in large villages. Uh, these villages would be sites like Zilam, uh, a site uh, that is some 32 acres large and were capable, capable of supporting some 2,500 people. Other sites were, uh, were even larger than Zilam, like uh, Malamkari, which is about 75 acres large um, and, and, still, uh, and still really hasn't been studied in great depth. Uh, Zelum, uh, we, we've studied, and Zelum is a flat site, and it is full of pottery, which is a good thing. Um, most of archaeology is really just examining pots, um, so the abundance of pottery there gives us a, um, a, a, a nice sort of uh, starting point, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of starting point, and a lot of um, uh, artifacts to examine, to study, to gauge the development of 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 uh of the city uh well not even a city but just of the population center of uh, zealand now these sites um really all of them have not been studied in in great detail i should say um the the uh they, they haven't been studied to the detail that would allow us to examine the specific details of these sediments um now the work done at zealand is still very recent and it's still in its infancy uh, Zelum has revealed the existence of several storage pits and a variety of large ditches. Um, uh, particularly, the the, uh, the ditch at Zelum is about ten feet deep, and this is uh, this is similar to features at uh, at, at uh, other sites. Uh, now, the motivation for constructing the ditches uh, the ditches is unclear, and we still need more uh, research. Uh, to be done on the uh, on on the ditches and the local site to to exactly figure out why why the people are doing this. Now there were similar features at other sites, and the motivation for constructing these ditches is unclear. Um, possible ex explanations include um, the ditches were part of a rampart and ditch um, network for defense which would suggest that there were some intercommunal conflict in the Lake Chad Basin um, uh, at, at a very early date, stretching back to around 500 BCE. Now, site sizes are not that great um, uh, along the, uh, the south of, uh, of Lake Chad. Uh, we do not... Um, We, we, we really don't see uh, the type of site and intensity that, uh, that, that existed elsewhere. Um, the sites that we do find are small, uh, and they're smaller than Zelum. They're smaller than 32 acres. By the first century, um, site occupation was leveling out with mound sites all over the, uh, the Tibesti Mountains. Um, these, uh, these, uh, these will be prominent um, around these mountains and, uh, and they will be located on isolated peaks which all point to a need for defense. Now these locations are at places um, where refuge could be easily sought in times of stress. At, uh, at Iso Durham for example there are horse remains uh, dating to the first century. Uh, the possession of horses is a great insight to the region um, and, and their trading contacts. Um, now the military and, they, and the horses also point to militarism uh, amongst the groups that possess them, and this suggests the presence of uh, an elite class among that military and among these uh, these centers. In this region, horses became a substantial and a very public illustration of one's wealth, um, not, not only one's wealth but one's authority and one's power within the uh, within the existing social structures. Keeping horses was then, as it is now, uh, very expensive. Horses require substantial upkeep. Uh, displaying a horse shows that an elite uh, had the ability to care for and feed horses. Horses also became the, the basis for elite warfare. Um, south of the deserts was featured um, 
it, the warfare would have featured the uh, the peasants walking around and the nobles riding horses. Uh, horses also became central to the development of slave raiding and slave trading in this region. Uh, horse um, horse uh, horseback slave raiding was carried out by the mounted raiders, who would uh, who were very active in the Trans-Saharan slave trade. Now we have found dozens at um, Iso uh, Durham. Um, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and we really don't find any at the, uh, contemporary neighboring sites, which indicates, uh, social and political differentiation between the regions, uh, meaning that we have this one site that is dominating, um, really sort of, um, uh, engaging in this, uh, in this habitual raiding, this habitual conflict with their neighbors, um, and profiting at the expense of their neighbors. Now, the early second millennium saw the progression of, of uh, expansion of, the, of such predatory militaristic states um, in, into the, uh, the late Chad Basin. Um, states like Canamborno, uh, which developed in the late first millennium along the northwestern shores of Lake Chad. Uh, states like Begini, um, we, we know very little about the uh, political and the social developments of Canon Borno, um, again, due to a lack of research and archaeology um, done in the region. We haven't had um, they've done nearly uh, the type of research done on, along the northeastern Lake Chad uh, region uh, to, to, to piece together what was happening there. And our historical texts are all fragmentary. Uh, it is likely that Canon Borno gained power through uh, through control of the Trans-Saharan slave trade um, in the in the Lake Chad Basin. Slaves were the main export. Now, Canon Borno dominated the plains of Lake Chad um, for the next few centuries, and 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 really uh, a set of complicated interactions would develop between small locum states and these large hegemonic states. Uh, the result was a great variety of social and political responses in this region. Now, groups like the uh, Wandala converted to Islam and they began to compete with Canon Borneo on the plains of Lake Chad. Other populations moved into the mountain to seek shelter from the slave raiders. Uh, this led to the development of a divergent social, political, and religious contrast between the people living in the mountains and the states developing on the plains. One response by the mountain people was to construct a set of stone monuments. Um, and and, uh, and these, uh, these were accompanied by long systems of walls, terraces, and platform passageways. And they represent some of the finest examples of dry stone architecture. Um, much like we will find at, uh, at another African site, Great Zimbabwe, and also um, uh, uh, along the same line that we had already examined at Axum. Now, the construction were the, the construction of these uh, defensive measures were in response to a variety of social pressures. Um, they, they, they serve one had they, uh, they, they one serve a ritual uh, display function, and they also have political meaning. Uh, and now the people they they also constructed them to uh, to sort of defend themselves from the the people living on the plains, and it hints at the type of relationship then in existence between the uh, the slave raiding states on the plains and the the people who uh, were were living who had moved to and were now living in the, in the mountains. And we will break here. We will come back and we will continue our examination. Our look at the development of African states. As always, I'm Ted. Hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you thought about this lecture, and when I see you guys, now when we come back, we will continue on with our look at African history.